So you can see it started off as emollients and creams, but I changed the name to moisturizers because that's a more comprehensive term. And I, that's when I gave it to the talk to the Wound Care Society earlier this year. Um, and there was a bit of a story to that. Uh, conflicts of interest is that there are lots of companies that produce emollients and some of them pay for Dermnet. Definitions. So an emollient is on the next page, I think. Um, an ointment. An ointment is grease, no water. A cream has water in it. If you put water in something, it goes mouldy, so you also have to have a preservative. Lotions are more liquid than creams. You can pour them. An application is a solution. A gel also has high water content. And a paste is stiff, so it's a powder and an ointment. So those are just different types of things. Um, so a moisturizer is a topical product for dry skin. It reduces water evaporation, so it holds water in the stratum corneum. For it to do so effectively, you need a mixture of different products that have various different properties. So there's a humectant, which attracts water, an emollient that softens the skin, and an occludent that stops it evaporating. The emollient is that softening or oily component of a moisturizer. Liquid paraffin, dimethicone, squalene, isopropyl, mystirate. Myristate. Now, I'm not a chemist. A humectant is something that attracts water, so that's where the glycerin comes in, and it makes the moisturizer more effective because it, it keeps the water where you want it. Um, so if it has to hold water, then it has to be a cream, really, to, so it's sorbeline and glycerine cream. Um, and an occludent traps the water, so it holds it where it is. So petroleum jelly occludes the skin. Um, so you probably know what we're talking about here. So stratum corneum is the dead skin cells on the surface of the skin, sometimes called the horny layer. just contains keratin and a natural moisturizing factor and a few other bits and pieces granular layer is the skin cells dying off, losing their um, nuclei. Basal layer is the growing cells that proliferate. We've got a uh, melanocyte here, which produces melanin in little granules, and the melanin gets squirted into the keratinocytes as they move upwards. So a normal stratum corneum is a barrier to irritants, allergens, foreign bodies, and pathogens. But an abnormal stratum corneum may not be very good at doing those functions. So the skin can get dry, it can get infected, it can get injured. So a normal stratum corneum has natural moisturizing factor in it, which is a, a mixture of proteins and um, emollients. Sebum, things like that. So the, the structure isn't always normal because there are various influences that might make it abnormal, like an injury, a genetic defect. So a protease is an enzyme that eats proteins. So if you've got too many proteases, you're eating your skin away, and uh, it may not be very effective. Protease inhibitors are proteins that stop that happening. So it's, we've always got a balance between proteases and protease inhibitors. And pH, so the natural pH of the skin is 5.5, but if you have a more an alkaline environment such as produced by soap, so soaps are pH 10 to 14, um, soaps are really, really bad because they damage the skin and they increase proteases and they reduce protease inhibitors, so your skin is uh, in a bad way. And then, of course, you may be covered in bacteria. Well, we want to be covered in bacteria because that's normal. We have a normal back microbiome. But disturbances occur to the microbiome, not, a, not much of which is understood. Um, and uh, so a, a microbiome may contain pathogens 
or an abnormal mixture of non-pathogens. And treatments. So topical steroids destroy the stratum corneum. So they're good because they're anti-inflammatory, but you don't want to be using them all the time because they prevent the production of a normal stratum corneum. Uh, so if your barrier function isn't good because your stratum corneum isn't working properly, you degrade not only the corneocytes, which are the cells, dead cells, but also the links between them, which are the desmosomes. So one cell is stuck together to another by desmosomes. Uh, so that might be because you're very young or very old. It might be because you have a genetic disorder such as filaggerin deficiency, a disease such as atopic eczema or bullous pemphigoid. You may work in contact with irritants. That's a particular problem with hands, but some of us are exposed to irritants on our faces as well. Why would anyone put any stuff on their face? You get it? You're changing the microbiome. You're, ca you're causing irritant dermatitis. Why would you do that? The natural skin is mostly able to look after itself. Um, but if you've got dry skin, it's a good idea to moisturize it. Long, yeah, we've dealt with that one. Uh, so what's natural moisturizing fa factor? Well, you can wash it out because it's, um, so if you wash too much, you're washing out your nat natural moisturizing factor. So don't wash, it's bad for you. Humans weren't developed to wash, were they? When did people start washing themselves? Queen Elizabeth I was supposed to take one bath a year. That's probably all we need. But modern life says you're not allowed to smell, not allowed to be dirty, you have to wash, uh, and it is normal for people to wash once a day, twice a day, some people. Some people more often than that considered normal. But it's not very good for your skin. Uh, Filaggerin deficiency, so a significant proportion of people with stratum corneum difficulties like eczema and ichthyosis, fish scale skin, um, are deficient in filaggerin or the filaggerin doesn't work properly. It's a protein that causes the skeleton of cells that makes your stratum corneum. Lipids, so we have these fatty things, they repel water. Don't wash them out so easily. Uh, sebum. Sebum's only on the scalp and the face, a little bit on the chest and back. Um, and that is good at retaining stratum corneum too. So we wash the dirt off. We wash the dead skin off. We wash the healthy skin off. We remove the natural moisturizing factor. Uh, so in order to wash, we have to have something with a surfactant like a detergent, you know, take the grease off the plates. So if you've got a bad one, you, your skin is going to feel tight. You know, if you use dishwashing liquid to wash your face, it's probably going to feel a bit tight afterwards. And your skin will actually swell up a bit to try and recover from it. And then it'll be dry afterwards. So Lots of people say, well, I cleanse my skin, then I moisturize it. Well, of course they do, because they've washed off the goods, so they have to replace it with something. Um, and these products are full of all sorts of irritants and allergens, like fragrances and preservatives. Uh, water alone is bad enough. So they've tried to produce some products that are more beneficial than harmful. Um, so, how do I wash my face? Uh, I just use a bit of water. Once a day, maybe. Soap. Well, you don't want a soap. So, a proper soap is, is very alkaline. Um, the first soap was produced in 4000 BC. It was found at the bottom of um, some rivers where there was a combination of an alkali and a the right salt. So if you put pH on the skin, it dries out more, it becomes flaky, may get dermatitis. You get an increase of a bacterium called cutibacterium acnes. It used to be called propionibacterium acnes, but its current name is cutibacterium acnes. An increase in proteases and you can get some increased pigmentation. Uh, so they developed these synthetic detergents that would avoid those things. So they, they have a, a natural pH. Um, 
they don't stay on the skin. So if you use soap, you leave bits behind. The soap stays on the skin and continues to irritate it. So you can wash them off. Uh, they can put uh, moisturizing factors into the cleansers, including emollients, humectants, and occlusives. Uh, you can obtain syndats that don't have fragrances and color and essential oils, but they will still need preservatives. Preservatives can cause irritation. Preservatives will cause allergy. Um, so in order to cleanse the skin, you have to have a surfactant. And the most common surfactant has been sodium lauryl sulfate, but that's an irritant and has been replaced mainly by some other products. So aqueous cream uh, historically had sodium lauryl sulfate in it to make it foam. People, when they're cleansing their skin, they think they need some foam. You know, it feels really good to have this foam. Uh, but actually, it's not the foam that does the cleansing. Um, and so currently funded aqueous creams do not have SLS in. So they'll say SLS free. They still have a preservative in them, though. And it depends which brand of aqueous cream, which preservative. Because it's aqueous, it's got water in, has to have a preservative. Preservatives are good, they stop mold. Preservatives are bad, they cause irritation and sometimes allergy. So, um, Pharmac, under bath additives and shower preparations, mention aqueous cream, they tell us that's fully funded. Oatmeal colloidal. So oatmeal is um, good at absorbing water. It's a good moisturizer. Liquid paraffin and lanolin. Um, problem with these things you put in the bath is the bath becomes slippery. You break a leg. They're not recommended. And there's no evidence. There's recent evidence suggests bath additives are not much use really. All they do is cause ma more harm than good. What we do want to avoid is bubble bath because bubble baths are very high surfactant in order to cause bubbles. So if babies and children are going to use bubble bath, it needs to be very infrequent, even if they've got healthy skin. Not good for the skin. Um, dry skin. So dry skin is normal in aging. It's normal in the very young, and it's abnormal at other times. So if you've got dry skin, it's a disease or a condition. Ichthyosis dermatitis, rosacea, irritants, and washing. So, uh, which are we going to use? Well, you've got millions of choices. I mean, you just walk into a pharmacy, you walk into a, a department store, you walk into a supermarket, and there are rows and rows mm -hmm. and rows of them. Yeah. And you may decide you like a brand, you know, you've been marketing as one, and you've decided that brand X is where you're going to go. And then you discover brand X has, like this, there's the blue one and the green one and the purple one and the red one and the yellow one. And when you talk to the people who manufacture them, they go, ah, oh, they're all the same. <laughs> they just create more space on the, on the shelf. There isn't much difference between the, the red one and the green one and the blue one. It's marketing. But there are some differences, of course. Um, so uh, which one does the patient prefer? How old are they? Uh, if you're going to use a very difficult tube, you know, can't take the top off, or it's very stiff, they're not going to be able to get it out of the tube. They're not going to use it. Um, you can pay a thousand dollars for 20 grams of a fantastic moisturizer. Why would you do that? Because even the best moisturizers only last for a few hours. So marketing, people do buy these things. They do pay this money. I don't understand. Uh, what is it? System one thinking? Um, cost. We are very, very fortunate to have uh, a drug buying agency that does the thinking for us. And that uh, in New Zealand, we can choose one of the subsidized products and large quantities are provided at low cost. And we've got a good range of products. And there isn't any need really to purchase other products. But people do, and they may feel nicer. 
They may not have the same smell. They may have some more pleasant uh, association with them. Uh, they may fit in their toilet bag more easily and so on. And people prefer creams to ointments because they're easier to put on and they're less sticky and gooey. Um, so in eczema, we've got very irritated skin and a large number of moisturizers sting and irritate and it can be really, really difficult to persuade child or mother of child to apply the products. But if only they could get them on, they would actually reduce the itching and the stinging next time. And um, using the, cr the creams can reduce bacterial infection and reduce the amount of topical steroid needed or required. But if they're too thick, they won't use them. If they're too thin, they won't use them. If they're in the wrong color bottle, they won't use them, and so on. Uh, psoriasis. So we use less moisturizers in psoriasis, but they can be useful to make the scale transparent or to lift it off so it's not so obvious and not falling behind you. Um, and they can actually improve the psoriasis a bit without any help from any other topical agents, particularly when occluded. So people with very localized psoriasis, they could just put a moisturizer on and then put some glad wrap over it or maybe you could, you, we used to buy, be able to buy these psoriasis um, things, they, they were basically duoderm extra thin dressings uh, but they were specially marketed for psoriasis so you'd put your moisturizer on, you'd put the dressing on and they'd leave it there for a week and that was helpful. Uh, I don't think we can get these now. Um, so if you have something that doesn't have any water in it like petroleum jelly, it doesn't sting. Um, so that's something. Um, lots of the components of a moisturizer increase the stinging. You can be allergic to things in moisturizers and it could be quite hard to work out what it is because the same ingredient may be present in several different products and uh, knowing that all these things you'd never heard of could cause allergy it's not very helpful really so if you do have someone who believes they're truly allergic to a cream then uh, get them to use petroleum jelly because you're not allergic to that or 50 50 can't be allergic to that they might not like it but that's not the same thing um, and um, we patch test, but patch testing is a complex and expensive thing. So when we talk about contact dermatitis, we're meaning that a rash appears because something has touched the skin. Now that might be irritant, so it might be just you've used too much detergent or too much water, or you've been, a contact dermatitis might be um, turning pages over. So one of my friends was a teacher, and exam time, she always used to get contact dermatitis because she would be flicking pages through exam papers. And it was like paper cuts, but it was producing a dermatitis. Um, acute chemical burn is, a, is an acute irritant contact dermatitis. Conic repetitive exposure to irritants, especially in the presence of low humidity. Allergy is much less common and is an actual hypersensitivity reaction to some protein, usually, or metal, or a few other things. So we've got nickel, which is a metal, fragrance, protein, preservatives, rubber accelerants, adhesives. And we confirm that by allergy. So 10 to 15% of women have a contact hypersensitivity reaction to nickel. And they know it because they can only wear expensive earrings. Now, it's not the only reason why you want to wear expensive earrings, because actually you can get a contact irritant reaction from cheap metal as well. You get little bits of particles, which are just irritating your skin. So 75% of people who say they're allergic to nickel are, but 25% turn out not to be. They just got sensitive skin. So, um, this is allergy. Well, these, these are marked around the wrong way. I need to correct that. Um, so this is an irritant reaction, so it's a baby dribbling. And when babies are just starting to feed, they're just trying out different things, they get banana all over them. 
um, and saliva all over them. And saliva and banana and whatever else will cause an irritant dermatitis and it's just something you have to live through. Who'd have a baby? <laughs> Let's just skip that bit and get on to when they can control their, where the food goes. Um, this is an allergy, so this is hair dye allergy. Now, I don't know why anyone wears, dyes their hair. Half the people in this room are dyeing their hair. Why? Let's grow old gracefully and be grey. Now, I tried that hair dye for 10 years. I got away with it. I stopped dyeing my hair when three people in one week came with contact allergy to hair dye. And the first one had dyed her hair 12 months earlier. And she still had dermatitis from head to foot, but it was precipitated by hair dye. The second one came in and had thought she would try it again. She didn't really believe she could possibly be allergic to hair dye. After all, the new hairdresser said, no, no, no one reacts to this. And she had and a severe blistering eruption over her face, neck, back, very seriously ill. And then the third one came in, and it was a man. And he had a dermatitis very similar to this one. And I said, that's it. I'm not dyeing my hair anymore. And then I read more about hair dye. Uh, there's some quite evil chemicals in that, those hair dyes. Uh, no, it's not quite as bad as smoking, but it's getting up there. Uh, so um, there, we, we have to think of something better. So the, the hair dye manufacturers are trying to produce better, better products that are less likely to cause allergy. There's some low-risk ri low hair dyes. We're talking about permanent hair dyes here. Um, but they haven't found one that doesn't cause allergy in someone. If you've already had allergy, you're more likely to react to one of these low-risk products as well. And just because it comes from the health food shop doesn't make it safe. They've all got the same products. So permanent hair dye causes contact allergy.